Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Demo democracy um, has really uh, a harder and harder time to accept uh, reforms and to reform itself. And we're seeing, can we borrow some ideas that exist uh, in the East, which tend to be more longer term in nature, uh, which are more community oriented, um, in theory more meritocratic, but on the other hand, much less accountable to citizens. So we compare, if you want, East and West, um, and um, we, we make a case for certain of the ideas that exist in uh, these very different systems. We've got, as the Institute, we've got three different efforts, a California reforms effort, uh, California being maybe the model of extreme democracy. Up to now, to get anything major done in California, you needed to, uh, to go to citizens directly, uh, referendum. So basically, California um, has been uh, almost governed through referendums uh, over the last um, you know, 100 years or so. And then we've, uh, we have a Europe group, uh, which focuses on, again, governance and structure. Our idea simply being that Europe is sort of uh, like a half-built house, where you've got a center in some ways. Um, uh, you have a currency, but you don't have a fiscal or financing uh, center. Uh, you've got an um, administration in Brussels that's quite removed <coughs> from uh, citizens around Europe. So Europe is almost an opposite case to California. We've, we think not enough uh, citizens' involvement, not enough democracy. Um, and then we've got a global project which focuses on, on G20, uh, the idea being that G20 today is um, uh, sort of the forum where uh, the, the old powers and the new powers get together uh, and uh, work on all, you know, all, all the large issues uh, that we feel um, is not necessarily that functional because it's, uh, it's, it's a yearly meet uh, with a roving presidency and uh, where um, uh, all 20 members have to unanimous, unanimously agree. So we try to interact with the G20 to hopefully um, uh, make some of the aspects of the G20 more effective or even propose some reforms as to how uh, they work. Thank you. All governing systems today, from China to the US to Europe, are experiencing disequilibrium because of the combined impact of globalization and rapid technological advance. We are in the midst of a great transition from American-led globalization, which we call Globalization 1.0, to what we call Globalization 2.0, due to the rise of the rest, the emerging economies. Thanks to the convergence of patterns of growth and the spread of technology, the emerging economies from China to Turkey to Brazil are leveling the playing field. Far from becoming a flat world, however, economic strength engenders cultural and political self-assertion. Witness the Neo-Confucian caste of China, the Neo-Ottoman caste of Turkey, the world's two fastest growing economies. Thus, the new economic and technological convergence is taking place has also given birth to a new divergence. Globalization 2.0 is above all an interdependence of plural identities. As diversity grows among cultures and nations, it is also growing within societies because of the demassification of standardized industrial society into ever more plural niches, identities, digital tribes because of the decentralizing impact of information technologies, especially social media. Greater diversity along with cultural and political awakening is part and parcel of this transition underway from Tahrir Square in Egypt to the Indignados in Spain, the Tea Party in the United States, Catalonia, even the villagers of Wukan in China. People everywhere are demanding a meaningful participation in the way their lives are governed. This presents a double challenge to governance. To accommodate the demand for participation, power must be devolved downward toward the grassroots. 
At the same time, because of the interdependence I've described, greater consensus building institutional <clears throat> capacity, such as uh, associated with meritocratic uh, type of governments such as Singapore, to some extent China, is required to capably manage the systemic links of interdependence and the greater complexity of diversity. The failure to find an institutional response to this double challenge will result in a crisis of legitimacy for all governing systems, either because of the failure to produce inclusive growth and employment or because of a democratic deficit that shuts out diverse voices will undermine effective consent. When we talk about intelligent governance, we talk about devolve, involve, and decision division. It's the operating system that we uh, propose that will reconcile knowledgeable democracy and accountable meritocracy. What we do in the book then is engage in an exercise of political imagination by designing a template of how, how intelligent government, governance might work institutionally. Then we review how, in the various projects Nicholas described, California, Europe, at the G20 level, how these ideas might be implemented in a practical way, how, might they be, how the principles might be molded to practice. Since every operating system is at a different state of disequilibrium, uh, they have to move in different directions. So for example, as we will discuss in California or the United States, uh, you need more consensus building institutions with uh, the power to create uni un unity of purpose and long-term uh, implementation of policies. In China, obviously, you need much more democratic accountability, transparency, and rule of law. In Europe, you have the European Commission, which is a quasi-meritocratic institution, but as we all know here, it lacks democratic legitimacy. So this is not a one model fits all. We're we talking about states of disequilibrium across different governing systems, all of which have to re recalibrate because of the global transition underway. We focus on China and the US as the core systems of the global order not as literal alternatives, but as a metaphor to help identify the trade-offs between the popular sovereignty of democracy and the long-term horizon and meritocratic qualities uh, associated with uh, Chinese governance. China continues to adhere to the centuries-long attributes of its institutional civilization rooted in rule by expertise and experience of tested elites. True to its no-party Confucian roots, China today operates under a one-party system in which consensus is reached through internal competition based on performance instead of external competition where different constituencies of the body politic are mobilized against each other. Once consensus is reached, this enables a greater unity of purpose in the effective long-term implementation of policies. The US, of course, is the largest and most dynamic example of one person, one vote democracy. Within the US, we focus on California since it carries the idea furthest through direct democracy of the initiative process, which Nicholas mentioned, where voters can make laws and change the Constitution directly. As is often the case, the extreme reveals the essence, and California most exposes the problems of democracy taken to the extreme. Now, of course, there are other institutional arrangements in democracy, the Westminster system here in Britain, uh, or the more consensus capacity that exists, say, for example, in the Scandinavian countries. But we focus on these two uh, 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 systems because uh, they're really the pole systems, the bookends uh, of the world order, and how they govern themselves will shape the future of the world order. 35 years ago, California Governor Jerry Brown, he's governor again now, as most people may know here, and he was governor <laughs> back in the 70s. Uh, governor Brown and I went to China 35 years ago. In those days, it was a backward country, of course, just barely out of the Cultural Revolution. People were barely able to feed themselves Everyone still rode bicycles in Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, the uh, Three Gorges Dam was just, uh, the, the ground was just being broke for the Three Gorges Dam. And the Shenzhen and Pearl River Delta was, uh, now the factory of the world was uh, not more than a village. Everyone knows what has happened since then. 400 million people have been lifted out of poverty. High-speed rail connects mega cities with state-of-the-art subways underneath. Shanghai schools test the best globally. And of course, China is the second largest economy in the world. In those same 35 years, California, the bellwether state that once dreamed of building a society as magnificent as its landscape, has ended up with mountains of debt, D-plus schools, spending more on prisons than education, and an infrastructure uh, that's so crumbling that China puts it to shame. Now, of course, China is a developing country. The United States is an advanced economy, particularly California. But we ask, uh, what could we learn from these two experiences over 35 years? Now, despite China's well-known problems, corruption, 
uh, extensive corruption, lack of rule of law, freedom of expression. It was clear to us that the modern meritocratic elements of its mandarinate at the heart of its nominally communist system with its capacity to create unity of purpose and long-term institutional execution of policies had presided over the single most impressive alleviation of poverty in history. It was equally clear that despite being the birthplace of Apple, Google, and Facebook, California's public space had deteriorated because its democracy had become dysfunctional, captured by short-term special interest political culture. China's system is not self-correcting without major reform, as the ones I mentioned. Rule of law, getting rid of corruption, more democratic feedback and accountability, more transparency. The unconventional observation in our book is that democracy, in the US especially, as it is practiced, is no more self-correcting than financial markets, despite one person, one vote elections, without reforms that strengthen consensus building institutions with a long-term horizon, insulated from direct politics and adversarial uh, fights of special interest and short-term mentality of its voters. In short, China needs to lighten up, the United States needs to tighten up. Now, three reasons we argue why uh, uh, the self-correction of democracy is a challenge. First, we no longer live in an industrial democracy, but a consumer democracy. In a democracy, people get what they want. In a consumer democracy, they get what they want when they want it, which is now. We live now in a kind of Diet Coke culture, where just as people want sweetness without calories, they want consumption without savings, infrastructure and education without taxes. The same California voter that resists paying $50 for a vehicle license fee to pay for police and fire will spend several hundred dollars on the latest iPhone technology. The driving ethos of consumer democracy invites populism that can't be paid for. It is easy to see from this dynamic how self-interest of the immediate gratification of, of voters results in exuberant bubbles, mountains of debt, and fiscal crisis. To go against the grain requires extraordinary leadership and comes at a high political price because good policy tends to be bad politics. We were just with Gerhard Schroeder uh, in Germany. <clears throat> Gerhard Schroeder's Agenda 2010 reforms are a good example of this problem. As Schroeder himself says in frustration, the result of structural reforms which he put in place on labor flexibility, pensions, welfare, new investment in R&D can take a decade or more to reveal their impact, but elections take place immediately and reform measures are always unpopular. So the German public removed him from office and now 12 years later, after he introduced the measures, Germany is the strongest and most competitive economy in Europe and in some ways in the world. Just as financial markets mispriced the bonds of Greece, Italy, and Spain over the past several years based on German economic strength, so too democracy mispriced the value of Schroeder's reforms. The last few weeks, Obama, President Obama sat down with some historians, uh, and they asked him, what's the most frustrating thing that you faced being president of the United States? Obama says, the inability to get people to think long term. It's hard to make a case for solutions to problems when you're not going to feel either the problem or the solution, but you have to go to the voter anyway. Now, second reason. Deliberative institutions that enlarge the public view have withered and been overtaken by partisan rancor and the narrow short-term horizon of the voting public. The resulting gridlock and inability to find consensus has paralyzed governance. We already see halting efforts to respond to this with meritocratic type of solutions. In the US, because of the fiscal gridlock which Obama faces now, even after the election, same thing as before, last year when there was gridlock over the budget, uh, the US uh, Congress set up a super committee because they couldn't get it, they couldn't uh, respond to, uh, they couldn't figure out a plan to cut the, the long deficit, the long-term deficit, either by tax, increasing tax revenues or, or cuts. So they set up a super committee of the wise and the smartest guys in the Congress, take them out of the political arena and say, let's come to a solution. Well, so far that has failed, uh, and I'm sure the US Congress will try it again. Now there's a growing recognition that when deliberative bodies in democracies wither, the seeming rationality of short-term fixes and ballot, at the ballot box can result in wholesale problems, as I mentioned, of irrational exuberance, mounting debts, a fiscal crisis. In California, we ended up with the unintended consequence of spending, as I mentioned, more on prisons than higher education after a series of initiatives that on their own made a whole lot of sense. 
cutting uh, property taxes because they were too high for old, uh, old people living in their homes or getting tough on crime. In California, the ungovernability problem is that as a result of undeliberated democracy through initiatives, ballot box mandates by citizens have locked in spending and locked out revenues. The prime example of this is, was an initiative passed several years ago called Three Strikes, You're Out. If you commit three felonies, even if the third felony is stealing gasoline from a gas station, you're automatically sentenced to 25 years in prison. So when the voter went into the ballot box, this was a very rational thing. We need to get tough on crime and put those prisoners away. On the other hand, the same public didn't want to vote any more taxes to build prisons. As a result, this, earlier this year, the US Supreme Court ordered California to release 36,000 felons because of human rights violations in California prisons because of overcrowding. This is not surprising. We, a poll was done a couple of weeks ago in California uh, leading up to this current election we just had yesterday uh, over the tough budget choices. And the first question was, who should make the tough budget choices? The, gov the elected officials, the governor and the legislature, or the public? Only 10% said the governor and legislature, that everyone else, 80% said uh, the public. Then the next question was to the same public, to the same uh, po uh, people being polled, what is the greatest source of revenue for the state and what's the greatest expenditure? And the same uh, people didn't know either answer to either question. Uh, the answer is K through 12 education, in case you get polled, <laughs> K through 12 education on the one hand and income tax on the other hand. Francis Fukuyama has argued that democracy in the US as well as in many other places has decayed into a vetocracy, vetoocracy, like democracy, veto, vetocracy. By this he means the general will and long-term fiscal health of the system have been subverted by special interest lobbies and the short-term mentality of ideologically rigid or narrowly focused constituencies. These organized groups, from teachers unions to uh, financial corporations, have amassed the clout to veto whatever threatens their hold on government and its spoils. Witness the inability of President Obama to make any major changes in financial regulation after the crash uh, in 2008. These uh, veto-empowered uh, um, organizations accrete to the system like barnacles and anchor it to the past. The votes of the diaspora of unorganized citizens are thus steeply discounted, if not meaningless. A vote for democracy in this decayed system is, in a sense, a vote for the past because it's a vote for the vested interest of the present that, over the years, have staked their claims on the system. It is a system, again, almost guaranteed to generate debts and deficits while blocking any change to the status quo. In conclusion, we are not, of course, making the case that China is a better system or US is a better system and China should adopt multi-party democracy and the West should become Confucian. Of course not. Um, what we are doing, again, is using these core systems at a meta as a metaphor to identify the trade-offs required for good governance. In our view, the best system of governance would be a balance between the long-term horizon knowledge-based and consensus-forming attributes of meritocracy with the accountability of popular sovereignty. Further, we argue that this combination of knowledgeable democracy and accountable meritocracy is not far from the vision of the American founding fathers who designed institutions to ward off both monarch and mob. Every system needs circuit breakers to correct disequilibrium. Financial markets need them to correct exuberant bubbles and imbalances. Meritocracies and mandarinates need accountability. So too, one person, one vote democracies need nonpartisan deliberative institutions with a long-term horizon, rooted in popular sovereignty and legitimated by popular sovereignty, but insulated from direct electoral politics. Democracy, by its nature, generates contention, disconsensus, and diversity. The challenge is to be able to govern it effectively. Thank you very much.